Real Talk is proudly sponsored by Huawei P20 Pro and MTN. Each week for 10 weeks, we're giving away the latest Huawei. Good evening, a happy Friday to you and welcome to Real Talk with me, Azania. A vast world filled with unimaginable landscapes. Characters and stories exist in pages of a sea of books across the world. And what a pity it is that as a lover of books, one will never be able to read all the books in the world in one lifetime. Well, in a great book, one can live several lives and explore ideas that stretch further than the mind can hide. And my guests this evening are all authors of great books and tonight we'll get to explore their stories and the journeys of writing these books. First up, she describes her latest book as a collection of stories about nobodies who discover that they matter. Let's welcome best-selling author Mohali Mashiko to Real Talk. Mohali, welcome! Thank you for having me. You know, you have worn different hats over the years, so it's such an honor to have you here. Because, you know, when you're watching people from a distance, and you're like, oh, she is powerful. I like her. Okay, that's it. The interview's over. over. You, you said you like me. I'm going home now. <laughs> but let's go back because we'll talk about Intruder, uh, which is Intruders, which is actually right here for everybody to see. Uh, but your first book was Yearning. Yes. And it took a while for you to write this book. It was 10 years. In the making. You're in 2006, I worked at an advertising agency and I hated everyone. I hated the canteen. I, hate, <laughs> like, I hated coffee. Every, everything. And people used to come to me at lunchtime and say, oh, let's go eat. And I was so tired of saying no. So I s opened up a Word document and I started typing. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was typing. But by the time that job was done, I knew that there was a story there. Yes. But then, you know, I started working in radio and that was nice. Then I worked somewhere else and then I started writing what will be my my third book and my best friend said to me how you do one thing is how you do everything mm. so if you didn't finish the yearning you're not going to finish whatever book you think this is yes so i actually finished it out of spite to, <laughs> to, to show her up. that i can finish things but it put the it lit the fire it lit the fire under your proverbial bottom it really did yeah so that you could do this and then it ended up winning that uj uh, literary prize I know, right? And whenever you win a prize, people are like, oh, I'm so surprised. I was like, no, really. It is are, they, are they short? <laughs> Can I get this in writing? <laughs> oh, you were shocked. I was shocked. Oh. I was very, very shocked. My first book, I didn't expect people to, to connect with it the way they did. So I'm still in shock, honestly. Even sitting here, I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> what so am I doing? Let's look at Intruders. This is a collection of 12 short stories mm -hmm. and absolutely sublime. And there's a touch, of course, of the supernatural in some of your stories. What made you want to include that or have that as a signature or thread that keeps a lot of, that, that runs through all of them? You know, we grow up with these urban legends about Vera the Ghost, uh, Varus Makeup. Yes. Okay, now I'm scaring myself with these. That, but do you know what I mean? Like, we grew up with a lot of supernatural things anyway. Mm. But I think what was frustrating me was I was watching these movies about, you know, people in space, and they were always like, oh, yes, there's a woman on the cast, but it was never uh, a, a black woman, mm -hmm. you know? And also, I was growing tired of people who are in the back, people who are nobodies, you know. So I thought, well, they're going to be intruders by being the pe the people in the story, like the protagonist. Yeah. And I, I love, love just stories about ghosts and that kind of thing. So that was easy for me yes. because they're intruding in what they call speculative fiction. And they really are intruding. You won't find a kid on Nyaupe in Specfic. You won't find a mermaid from Soweto in Specfic. And I wanted all of these people to know that you belong in whatever genre. Yes. Whatever genre exists, you can be in it too. Yeah. Um, you talk about the mermaid, Manoka. Mm. What a beautiful story. And I think you have us gasping all the time. It's like there's this unfolding that happens and then you're like, oh, because you leave little 
teaser moments in different parts of the story. And then when the reveal happens, it's like, wow, didn't see that, didn't expect that, I didn't see that coming. And I think also you don't expect it coming because, well, it's a girl from Soweto, so how would she know that she's a mermaid anyway? Yes. And when she does, of course, something terrible happens because she didn't know. But I just love the idea of people being surprised about, oh my gosh, these are normal people mm -hmm. in supernatural, in, in extraordinary situations. And I, I love to do that to the reader where I'm like, you think you know because you this think. kid is on drugs, but actually, there's a lot he more may at be play. the hero. Yeah, there's a lot more at play. Yeah, and I think there's a skill that maybe isn't appreciated enough with the short stories, because you don't have, or you've told, or you, you've, you've given yourself this limitation, this boundary to say you don't have the full length of a book. Therefore, it has to be punchy, it has to move, it has to have pace. But at the same time, you still have to have that depth to yeah. the story, even though it is not as wide. Short stories, I described it today as short stories as CrossFit. You have to be fit all the time. Uh, and there's this thing in CrossFit where if you don't throw up, then you're not working out hard <laughs> enough. So <laughs> short stories are CrossFit and a novel is like training for a major marathon. Yeah. And that's what it is in CrossFit. There's no time to be like, oh, I won't go today, whatever. I'm take a minute's rest. It, it, there's no rest. No. Eh? And if you're not vomiting, even worse. <laughs> so I th <laughs> Who did this to you? <laughs> what gym is this that has got you so traumatized? <laughs> it's the whole CrossFit culture where people like work out till they pass out I'm yeah. like I, I don't know I don't yeah, yeah, know yeah, yeah. if you're passing out something is wrong <laughs> you're throwing so that's how it felt with with the short stories and I didn't have time to write those beautiful sentences and you know set up the scene I basically throw you into a story and I say here a girl killed a man find out why yes uh, and it's not something that all writers can achieve so I found your skill quite impressive when I think of Spiro Mahala's book, for instance, he also writes short stories yeah. very, very well, where each one is so standalone and so powerful on its own. So there, there is that level of skill that, like I was saying, is just not adequately appreciated. Thank you so much. My imposter syndrome is saying something else, uh -huh. but you're helping here. <laughs> this, this is therapy, actually. Oh, good. <laughs> good. We'll have more therapy after the break <laughs> with her, actually. Well, Halima Shiko is here. Her book is called Intruders. Join us after the break as we continue our conversation with her. <laughs> Welcome back to Real Talk here on SABC3. Tonight we're having a bit of a Friday book club. Right, so we're in conversation with some of the authors of the best-selling books at the moment. Their books are making waves. And Mohale Mashiko is an author of the latest African horror story book. And she's here with me. Would you agree with that description that it's an African horror? Or is that taking it too far? I, you know, I was surprised. Somebody sent me a message on Twitter and said, I can't stop thinking about Vera's now. And I was like, it's not supposed to be scary. If anything, you're supposed to be going, oh my goodness. Mm. Oh my goodness. The, but, the, oh my goodness is there. But I think maybe I underestimate how, how scary life can be. So I always talk about what inspired this was the horror of living in South Africa. This, this, this country is a horror story and we're so comfortable with it that if the audience was watching, they'd be like, yeah, yeah. Do yeah. they not see? Do they not see the <laughs> horror? So I think maybe the horror elements are the fact that you have to be faced with people that you can normally ignore. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm, as you said. And what's interesting is that you infuse little things maybe readers don't know, but you draw from different inspirations. I was saying to you, like even mermaids, they are to be found, or there's mythology and an understanding, not just mythology, but an understanding from an African spirituality uh, uh, perspective that. Yeah there is an energy, they are beings, so to speak, mm. with that mermaid spirit. And I wanted, I wanted it also to be a mermaid that anyone can believe, anyone in South Africa can believe, because I wasn't going to make her blonde, yes. with green eyes. She just didn't belong in this story. And there's some things that people will pick up because they know, and others that they won't, but they'll still enjoy the story. Yes, and when you think of a, a story like uh, B and B Bloom, yeah, you know, and some of your tales also touch on the things that we confront in South Africa at the moment: issues around gender-based violence. Yeah. So, uh, as 
as someone who is very active on Twitter, very active in these important conversations, mm. was it important for you to remain relevant to the things that we deal with every day that are part of the public discourse? I think when I finished this book, I realized how angry I was about being a South African and how horrible things are. So B and B in Bloom, initially I was going to, you know, because there's so many versions of this various story. Sometimes you wake up in, in like a grave site or whatever. And I thought that's boring. Everybody knows that. How about it be an energy mm -hmm. that is so tired of femicide mm -hmm. that it is now terrorizing men? And only once I got to the end, I was like, Oh my God, I think I was working out my South Africa issues. Yes. Yeah. Yes, being a woman in this country. It, it can be a horror story. Yeah. Yeah. So you are quite clear from the onset that this isn't Afrofuturism. Why did you want to distance the characterization of your work from Afrofuturism? Because there are certain pockets where it's finding expression. Yeah. I think so. The guy who coined Afrofuturism and now I'm going to botch the words, but he basically said, who can relate more to aliens than people who were taken from their mother country? <sighs> and also being a minority in a country, of course, when you write futuristic stories, you're a majority in the country and you're, you're in charge of the technology, so it's not being used against it's you an like American it was. American person. Do you, exactly, mm -hmm. so it was, in a, it was in an essay called Black to the Future. And I remember thinking, this is very nice, but South Africans are culture vultures and also cultural imperialism, so I don't want to leave that out. And I thought, we are going to start Afrofuturism and we're going to look dumb because we live in a country one where we're the majority. So we've got other issues. Yes. I just don't think that Afrofuturism is for Africans living in Africa. Mm, our reality is very different. It is very different. And we don't have this, not romanticized per se, but we, we don't have that, you know, yearning for the motherland, how, could it, how it could have been. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to now again, oh, this is going to make me unpopular. I was watching the kids at Afropunk last year, yes. and I was like, you're cosplaying somebody who is cosplaying you. And this is so sad because when you take something wholesale and you don't you don't interrogate it, you do start to look a little foolish. Shots fired. Shots fired. Shots, okay. It should have come with a, a with a warning <laughs> up front. You see, now I can't go out for drinks tonight because <laughs> those kids are gonna be like, we heard what you we said about you said. us. You even said we parrot. You know, yeah. so often we pa we, we're parrots of what is happening in the UK, in the US. I was like, oh, that's a very firm position and one that I need to sit with for a little bit because there were, there were times when I found it exciting and wondered about how it'll find expression. Yeah. But now that you've added that perspective, I'm looking at it sideways, like a S. Yeah, well, no, we share the guy as definitely, <laughs> but and I give our people an opportunity to say, and you can call it whatever you want to right. call it. I don't want to be the person that coins it, but I just want people to be careful of, and be critical. you know, just taking something wholesale because you do end up looking foolish and you lose so many opportunities to create something beautiful right here Absolutely. for Africans yeah. in Not Africa. Looking for validation across the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, your name is very interesting. It's not your, the name we'll find in your green ID book. No, it's not my government name. Yeah. So what is the tale behind Mohale Masheho? So my mom, before she became Mrs. Masheho, was Ms. Mohale. She was the party girl, always on a bus to Durban. I don't know what's happening in Durban, but <laughs> she was always out there in like her bell bottoms and her afro. And she had dreams of becoming a movie star. Yeah. But because she lived in a country where under apartheid, black women were, weren't even adults, um, that didn't happen for her. And I knew that if I was going to do something where my name was going to appear somewhere, yes. it would be me giving my mom a shout out and saying, I'm sorry you couldn't be a movie star. Star, but I've got you. So yes. my mom, Mohali, before she became Mashiko. So it's like, I like it when people call me Mohali because it means so much to me. Yes. Yeah. Well, that is, I just love that. I've heard the story before, but I just love it. Ludo Kazi is actually calling in from North Riding. Hello, Ludo Kazi. Thank you for calling in. Hi. Hi. How are you, Zanya? We're good. Thank you. What's your comment or your question tonight? Oh, I absolutely love Mohale. I, I am crazy about her style of writing. I just want to say to her, thank you so much for this, for being true to Africanism as well as 
Stay staying true to the story. And, and I, I read her book previously, which is the first one, The Yearnings, and I really enjoyed the style of writing and the fact that she makes reference to the townships that we're familiar with. So I say, I can't wait to see you tonight at the Book Circle Capital. I'll be there for today's discussion and I'll be getting my copy of this book as well. Thank you so much for your beautiful work. Wow, oh, wonderful. thank you. Thank you, thank for the you call so together. much. Yes. Wow. You see what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. So how's the music career? going my music career I, I like to say to people in the 1960s when I was a musician I was having a great time because it feels like it was so long ago mm -hmm. and the writing the writing for comic books is just a lot yeah so I'm hoping next year I, I'll be able to to put something even a song Nyana, just to remind myself that I'm I'm a musician yes black, black porcelain black porcelain. don't let that fall away and no. thank you for all the writing that you do in Kwezi Thank you. Beautiful stuff. It was a very tough um, job interview because I'd interviewed them and then I had ma maybe one or two whiskeys too many. And then I said, your pictures are pretty, but your writing is <laughs> censored for TV. <laughs> and they were like, what? I was like, the writing is shoddy. Yes. And then afterwards they said, you know what? The only way we can get better is if we build a team that has skills. And so you bring that skill, whereas so I welcome thought they to were- the team. Yeah, I, whereas I thought they were gonna be like, you are rude. Mm -hmm. You are a rude what person. What a brave team, what a brave team to have you on. <laughs> and when you said, Shh, Shoddy. <laughs> I was so relieved. I thought it was the other word. Uh, no, no, I know. And my mother's watching as well. Perfect, Mahali. So she would have been like, why Urakana TV? Yes, yes, I didn't raise you like that. Mm -hmm. Mahali, what a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Mahali Mashikh. Do check out the book, 12 short stories called Intruders. Let's take a quick break. More with the Real Talk Book Club after this. Welcome back to Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. If you've just tuned in, tonight is the Real Talk Book Club. And I'm joined by some amazing South African authors who've written books that could be brilliant reads for the spring of 2018. So we're helping you with your list of the must-read books this year. Gaja Kono has an inspiring story of soul revelation that is enough to show you just how resilient we are as human beings. He made friends and contacts in all the right places, including staying with the iconic, the late Brenda Fassi at some point. He loved, learned, and lived long enough to put his story into a book, and it's titled Game Changers. Please welcome onto Real Talk, media specialist and author, Gaja Kono. Well, some people, know you as Gash, so yeah. I know you as Gash, yeah. and Jay. Yeah. So that's why I was like, hey, gotcha, God, now we have to go back to the book and the ID. Hey. Welcome back to South Africa. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's, I'm honored. So your book, and I read it, I'd seen you in, we, we'd worked in the same building within yep. the SABC for so long, and you would think you know someone, mm -hmm. but you actually don't. And it was such a revelation about what is the frame of reference, what your background is, what informs the person that you are. Mm. Was it hard to put all of these things to paper? And it actually, uh, uh, just before, to, before I answer that, it actually makes you think with all the people around you, how many of us are walking around wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. When you think you know the people around you and you actually know nothing about it. Coming back to my book, I didn't, st being an author found me. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't set out to be an author. This started out as a, as a journal. It was at a point in my, in, in my life where I had just finished uh, with a broadcasting company and I was in between jobs, I was not getting anything. Mm. And I was like, I am just getting tired and South Africa is just, I, I'm doing the same thing all over again. I, I need challenges. And you know me, I just, I, I constant, I evolve all the time and I was like, I need to get out. Yes. How I ended up in the US, US was not even uh, uh, my cards. first choice. Mm. Um, I was supposed to go to, to, to Dubai. And how the book came about is when I was in the US and was sitting there, you know, uh, reviewing my life, you know, and meditating because I was in a very bad space. And I promise you, until you get to the bottom of your life and you really look at yourself for truly who you are, mm -hmm. you will never know, you will never know who you are. Do you feel so, free now? Oh, you know what? I think writing a book is the most emancipating thing. And I urge everybody, even if you don't get published, 
as I say, I started, it, this started out as a journal. To me, it was a diary, like, okay, this is what's happening in my life. Down the line, 100 pages, 120 pages, went back to, you know, you put it away, because it took me like two years to write this, because mm. I would write, and, and if you do that, you need to get into the emotions of everything in the journey that got you to right. where you are. And the reason it took two years, because some things were just too heavy to handle, uh, mm. uh, you know, all together. Mm. And I would put the book away, you know, get emotional, even cry. And once I got to that point, and I read what I'd written from page one to the last page, I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I felt so much lighter. And I was like, you know what? So it was cathartic. I need, I need to tell the story. Yes, because we hear that. Yeah. Like writing, putting your thoughts onto paper mm. just really cleanses you from within. There's oh, yeah. a, cath a catharsism about it. Yep. Mm. And the thing is, to get there is you need to live in the truth. Because also I went through the same, same motions where you're like, what are people going to think? You know, uh, how is this going to be? Are people going to judge me? Hey, but I'm ostracized and all of that. But if you get on the journey and you reach that bottom pit and you pick something down, then you're like, you know what? This is who I am. These are all my layers, the yeah, good, the bad, yeah, and the ugly. Yeah. Let's look at those because you left home. Mm -hmm. You came to Johannesburg yep. with the view of just wanting to... Big city, bright To life. be you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. To live in a little bit, have a little bit more freedom of expression mm -hmm. of who you are. But also remember, because uh, my birthplace is Port Elizabeth. Yes. Port, Port Elizabeth is, uh, is a beautiful city, but uh, especially with my sexuality, at that time, um, um, it was not so, people were not so open-minded. You mm -hmm. know, you'd be called mm -hmm. names and mm -hmm. all those things. And all I did was I, it pushed me into a point where I didn't really socialize because it was so hurtful going out. I, I hated soccer. I hated rugby, I hated cricket, which are all the sports that everybody plays back home. Boxing, yeah. So I found uh, my solace by just staying at home. I read everything from cookbooks to encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. and it was my escapism. Mm -hmm. I just needed to get into a different space. So moving to Jobik, I had created this environment, this, this, this fairy tale. And I was like, I've seen these people on TV and I want that life. Yeah. Even going to Jobik, I, uh, because at that time I was already staying in Umtata, I told my dad that I had an interview uh, in Johannesburg, and he bought me a ticket, and I was like, no, everything is sorted, accommodation, I've got mm. a friend I'm going to stay in, mm. which was a lie. Mm. And at that point in time, I, that was not my worry. I'm the kind of person where I, I try not to ruminate too much into an idea, because half the time we spend too much we time trying to convince yes, ourselves yes, not yes. to. To me, is once my gut is there, I go with it. Mm. It was only on the plane, then it was still uh, Transkei Airways, on the aircraft as the lens, le landscape, Johannes, the lights were in horizon. The landing. And they were saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelt to about, it dawned on me, I don't have any Where place to stay go? in Where am I going to go? And so you, only you, then. you hopped from flat to flat to flat. Yep. Yeah, living with different people yep. who you befriended along the mm. way, people who were willing to say, yeah, sleep on the couch, yeah, mm. there's a spare bedroom and so on. But that was also unsustainable. Of course uh, and then not. the time at Century Plaza, that is <laughs> an insane description of what happens to someone when they arrive in Johannesburg, mm. especially in that era of it, all the superstars, the big names, the people who then went on to become big names and where they started. Oh man, Hillbro then was, it was the place to be, you know, especially Century Plaza. Century Plaza was the haven. Yeah. On the one floor, there was Abu Men Zingubano. On the one floor, there was oh, Abu Lindy Wefasi. There was Abu um, uh, Messi Park. There was everybody. It was a whole new world. You know, I would walk in there and be like, You are. Uh, and I was like, I am right in the middle of this. And, and I was like, I'm not going back. I'm not going to back to the <laughs> Eastern Cape. This is what I've been looking And this is when I started, you know, uh, seeing all this lifestyle where Brenda had a girlfriend. And I was like, Huh? Mm -hmm. And then everybody, and you get invited to parties and people like, guys are kissing, girls are kissing. I was like, okay. On my little heaven. This is, but it's this heady. It can be. But it was overwhelming in the beginning. Overwhelming yeah. and it can also lead you to making poor choices. True. Yes. True. And you've had setbacks uh, and there was one particular setback that made you sit up and say, I need to get my life on the straight and narrow. Mm. It's enough of this chaos, you know, mm. one job, being frustrated at a job because you have a, a bad boss or someone who didn't like you. Next one, you're good at it, you have a certain level of success, you know, and mm. figuring that it's time to clean my cupboard. Mm. Mm. 
you, everybody needs to get to that point. It was a point uh, because Joe Big Life, if you don't have uh, a purpose or a direction or, or purpose of what you want out, out for your life, you will, and everybody will find a purpose for you. Mm. And that is exactly what happened. I got into a life of drugs. I got into a life of crime, uh, white collar crime. And it, 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 because everybody at that time, it was the in thing, you know, you needed to be seen with the right crowds and there was everybody. So if we was, think that maintaining lifestyles is bad now. Oh, please. That it was happening oh, then oh, too. Oh, please. Now, I think the only difference and why a lot of the, geez, I'm going to sound so old when I say this generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we had the background and the foundation where it was built on family values and all of that. It, now with the kids and, and uh, with what is happening now is a lot of them, they grow, uh, uh, they're being taught and raised by TV games and all those things. And with us, is you, you went outside to play. Yes. And by playing outside, it taught you life skills. You made toys with bricks, you made toys with everything. Mm. You became creative. So, and that helped yeah. in life. In where I, when I was confronted with situation, I was like, you know what, there's got to be a way out of this. Mm. And I never, even to this day, I never get into a situation where I'm like, okay, I'm stuck. How do I get out of yes, this? Yes, you learn to solve those problems. True. We've got a caller, in fact. Let's go to Shakes. Shakes is calling us from Bryanston. Hi, Shakes. Hi, hi, hi. How are you, Aga? We're super, thank <laughs> you. Welcome. Yes, well, yes, Aga. Uh, just a quick one. You know, I read uh, uh, Gatch's book, and the most amazing thing about the book is it teaches you a lot I mean, about around resilience, around dealing with your sexual orientation, uh, dealing with your economic challenges, and more than anything else, you know, it shows that, you know, no matter what happens in your life, there is a doorway. I mean, there's a chapter around being in the U.S. and uh, left, you know, basically to rot. And, I mean, he got away from those kind of things. And then he is sitting next to you. So it's a great book, you know, in terms of resilience. Thank you, Shigesha. Thank you. That's Shakes and Bryanston, a mutual friend, in fact. Uh, <laughs> so you decided to go off to the U.S. Mm. And, and trying to start a life in a foreign country mm -hmm. is so difficult, especially from someone who was living the high life. So it can be very humbling. That Once more, an occasion that brings you back. The greatest understatement, I uh -huh. promise you. I'm, and, you know, moving here... Um, Kind of a similar situation like when I moved from the Eastern Cape uh, where I just made a decision that I'm getting out of here. Because truth be told, when I left South Africa in my pocket, I had about 900 rands, not dollars. But I had made my mind that I was so enough of everything. I, I was just overwhelmed by everything. Nothing was happening, you know. I was in negative spaces and all of that, but I was like, I'm getting out of here. Mm. Got to the U.S. and in my mind, um, it was like, oh, you know, it's going to be a continuation of, you know, a lister fashion Don't week and all yeah. of that. Ha! Reality was knocked into me like within the first month. Like Americans, nobody cares. They're like, oh, you're like, oh, you, uh, I've done this, and I'm like, oh, okay. So what can you do for me? Yes. Nobody really is interested in yes, who so you story. were. Uh, that is as good as has happened in the book. Mm. So I quickly had to get on with the reality that, you know what, nobody knows me and nobody really cares who, what I've done or where I've been. And as soon as I started picking up the pieces, you know, especially at that time uh, when I had just, because there was a time um, uh, when I was sleeping on the streets mm. because again, similar situation like uh, when I got to Joburg, mm. where you move from one apartment, moving with one friend and another. Yeah. New York, New York is a huge place and a very expensive place. Yes. Nobody's got time for that. But you've Nobody's built yourself. Time. You've built yourself. <laughs> now there are all these opportunities that bring you back home, in fact. And we're going to be watching this space to see what you turn into, what, what you turn this situation, oh, yeah. this oh, growth yeah. into. Gash, it was great. It was oh, thank wonderful you very to have much. to thank catch you. up with you. <laughs> you know, if you really want to get to know someone and to see the truth that lies behind the mask, the veneer that we put on, this is the sort of book that gives great insights about the realities of what people live um, and from as he said being involved in crime being involved with drugs certain health setbacks and just such relationship setbacks made him want to start afresh so are you bold enough to actually just pick up your bags and go somewhere else and start afresh it's a very bold story of resilience after the break we are going to be chatting to author 
of a book that's based on daily Facebook posts for, and it's called Melusi's Everyday Zulu and it really gives life. You don't want to miss it. See you after this. My next guest caught the attention of many when his daily teachings on Facebook about popular Zulu phrases and anecdotes started going viral. According to Melusi Shabalala, there's an umzulu in all of us. And the man himself is here in studio to tell us more about his latest book titled Everyday Zulu. Hello, Melusi. So, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. I live for your posts. I came across it on somebody else's Facebook page. Luckily, you accepted my friendship request, and ever so often it would come up on my wall. Yes. And I would be chuckling and think, oh, what a creative person. <laughs> but in fact, you are in the creative industries. You've been in advertising, what, for 20 years or so? Yeah, for 20 years. I got into advertising in 1998 Yeah. as a trainee copywriter. and. I've been in advertising in different shapes and forms for 20 years now. Yeah, so what spurred this on? Because you talk about this discontent about how copywriters, about how advertising t uh, treats African languages. Yeah, um, so how the initial project came about, it was for as long as I've been in advertising, I've been not happy with how African languages are treated. Right, English is, is the golden child and the rest of us, we just must fit in somehow. Mm. So I decided that I'm gonna write this piece where I build a business case where it makes no sense to spend so much money creating vernacular advertising, but there's no quality control. Yeah. But when I read it, I thought, yes, in, they know these things, they just don't care. So on my Facebook, a lot of my friends are marketers and creatives and advertising people, so I thought, okay, let me showcase my language and what you can do with it, and hopefully that will inspire people to respect our languages a bit more. Yeah. So I decided to post one word, yes, Zulu, a day. Mm -hmm. It's English equivalent or translation, and a ridiculous story around it that brings it to life. Yes. And that's how this thing st started out. Yeah, so the posts got uh, really popular, they went viral, and now they, a lot of them are in this book. I mean, there is plenty, there's so many words. Let's look, and, and like you said with some of them, the English equivalent sometimes fails. It doesn't quite capture the yeah. nuance yeah. and the textures yeah. of the words in Isizulu. So something like Ukpapa. Yeah, yeah, Ukpapa. I mean, and I really think English needs to find an equivalent or adopt the word ukpap, <laughs> you know, because sometimes you're in a corporate setting and you want to say to a colleague, we are pap, yeah. you know, and you end up swearing at them because you can't find the right word. You know, you'll try presumptuous, which even though it's close, it's, it's nothing forward, it's too simple. Yes. So yeah, we need to find a way to incorporate ukpap into the English language. You, you describe it very well, uh, uh, even in the examples, because with lots of the words, you give actual examples. Yeah. I mean, I was rolling on the floor. Let me just look at these because <laughs> there was Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> which, not, which is not... Uh, it's not necessarily, it's a Zulu, but we've appropriated it. Absolutely. And it's the word for cartoons, animation and such. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and other words like lova. Lova, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, lova is to loaf, is to not attend class or work. So if you're banking, yes. we are lova. We are lova. And <laughs> if you're a person that banks, oh lova. But lova is also a term of endearment, you know, your body is wala lova. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, your kids and the, some of the things that happen in your home, because you're married with three kids, yeah. uh, have also inspired some of these uh, pieces, like Souza, the <laughs> description there with the teacher at school. Yeah, yeah. It's a fun life, clearly. So, I mean, as, as the title says, it's Melusi's Everyday Zulu. So it's about the world that I live in and how I navigated as a 21st century Zulu man, a 21st century African man. So yeah. the stories are about the things that happened to me, the things that are, happen around me. So the story is Souza. You know, um, I went to a parent-teacher evening and it, it, the, the teacher told me stuff about my kids and it was mostly positive. And then mm -hmm. she asked me to stay behind because she wanted to talk to me about something. And she told me that my daughter says, I've got a gas problem. You know? <laughs> and she started giving me recommendations. Oh, and I thought, to no, the this woman, how can she just <laughs> bring this up? You know, so I wrote about that to explain the word Souza. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a term that describes, or it, it, it has to do with the chickens, the battery chickens. Um, so 
in some ways, you reflect the true word in Isizulu, but you also come back to the colloquial use of the word, which I think makes the book incredibly relatable because we use them in our slang, in the streets, yeah. and the meaning um, gets richer and it also gets another layer, yes, which I yes. think is quite skillful. So it updates the language in that way. But you are from Mofolo in Soweto, and due to the apartheid system, there was also the separation to say Zulu section, Soto section, yeah. for instance, in Clipsbreit. And so this is your experiences of growing up in Mofolo. Tell me the story of when you first heard Sesotho. Look, I you know, with Mfolo, you have to be very specific because Mfolo, not all of it is Zulu speaking. Mm. So I'm from Scott Paula, which is extremely Zulu speaking, right? So I'd never heard Isutu in my life except on TV, and I figured that it just exists on TV. In your world, everybody, yeah, is every, spoke everybody spoke Isuzulu. <laughs> and then this one kid came to our neighborhood, his family moved to our neighborhood, and they spoke Isisutu, you know. And interacting him, with him one day, I was eating seven colors yam on a Sunday, and there was pumpkin. And he said, my pumpkin is umkopu. Yeah, mkopu. Yeah. You know, and then to me, mkopu sounded offensive. <laughs> or something like that. So we got into a fight, only to find out that he just said, it's pumpkin. pumpkin. Yeah. Pumpkin. So, so, and that's the beauty of South Africa. You know what I mean? We have so many languages, and the more we interact, the more we discover about each other. Absolutely. And what's interesting about Melusi's book, which has surprised him as well, is that part of his readership, as he says, is middle-aged white women. So it is worth the read. It'll uh, you will be accustomed with the use of the language, particularly Isizulu, across the country. Thank you so much, Melusi. Thank you for having. Me. And that's what it's called, Melusi's Everyday Zulu, not to be missed. It's a must-have in any home. Mapule Mathulazi is joining us after the break as we chat to this author who is trailblazing as far as children's literature is concerned. You actually don't want to miss it. Welcome back to Real Talk. My next guest is an author who caused a ripple in children's literature with her latest offering titled Ms. President, a very delightful book about a young girl who finds herself thrust into the unexpected position of being president for her country. The book has strong themes of girl power and women empowerment and equality. These are all relevant topics, of course, in modern day society. She's got a master's in African literature. She's working on that. It's currently underway. And numerous short stories published. That is Mapule Muhulati, who joins us now on the couch. Yeah. Congratulations on this Thank book. You. It Thank is beautifully so much. presented. The Thank illustrations you. are so vibrant. <laughs> So what inspired it? What did you think when you looked at the children's literature landscape? Uh, Pearl Statistics uh, came out in 2017, speaking about like 2016, and most eight out of 10 kids can't read with comprehension. They can speak English quite well, but they can't understand anything in any language. And that was quite problematic. Like I grew up in the library personally, and I was quite sad that like they aren't having the same childhood. Yes. Or they, they are in some way being robbed of something. And like I thought as a reader, and I do African literature, and it's just like, it's all about these big ideas. And na when you speak of the nation, it's all about this untroubled family romance yes. sort of thing. And I'm just, uh, I just thought, what is African literature to children? Right. Yeah. And then it, it's important for little girls and yeah. boys. Yeah, and boys, yeah, book, yeah. Not just little girls. Yeah. Why, why did you make it so? I, I thought for girls especially, because like at some point whilst writing the book, there was a boy bully. But like I wasn't trying to have like a victims on one side and the perpetrators on the other side, which is why at the end the president is also like there's some sort of redemption yeah. that happens. I wasn't writing a comic book, so I had to uh, like it's a girl because it's some, something that I identify with mm -hmm. for one, but it's for girls and for boys as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's quite relevant to what was happening in the country. This yeah. one, yeah. where you say that she may even correct some mislips and mistakes that President Balu has, has made. That, yeah, <laughs> children hear such things too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do hear <laughs> yeah. the narrative of what's going yeah. on around them. Yeah. They switched on, yeah. and there's a great character like a mythical bird, Hagar. Yeah. Hagar, yeah. yeah, Hagar, who helps yeah. to. Uh, create or help Lerato in this process of being president yeah. while the entire cabinet is off sick. Yeah. Why was it important to have that fantastical part? Is it a, to allow kids to imagine? Yes, and to play with like, and like, firstly, children's books are like so many giraffes and elephants and things. So I just thought like, I don't want to rob them of their animal. <laughs> at least one bird. <laughs> they need at least one bird. So I thought 
Hagar, and it, it's, it's a biblical reference, although for children you wouldn't, you wouldn't explain it as a biblical reference. But I like the name Hagar, and I like birds, and okay. I thought one huge bird. Do you <laughs> have to stay within this genre, or within this uh, category of it's books? It's something I ha like started playing with, but it's something I would like to grow in, because writing for children is actually harder than I thought. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, it's something we might not think about. Yeah. So what have you learned about, is, is it short sentences, is it about catchy words, very descriptive words? It is, it's also about rhyming couplets and just rhymes because they get bored quite easily and you need to entertain them. Classy, classy, yeah. just to keep them away. Yes, yeah. yes, no, yeah. it's well put together. <laughs> it's definitely well put together you. and you partnered up with just the right illustrator yeah. to yeah. bring the story Thank to you. life. Thank, thank you so much. Yay. Oh, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> well, you know what? I want to thank all of my guests. It was actually famous author Paul Sweeney who once said, you know you have read a good book when you turn to the last page and feel a little bit sad. It's as if you've lost a friend. And with that said, I think all of tonight's books are exceptional and I'm inspired by all of these authors and I hope you are too at home. So feed your curiosity, immerse yourself in the well of knowledge that exists in the galaxy of books that are out there. I want to thank my guests once more for being here on this Friday for our very first Real Talk Book Club. We'll see you again next week from the team and myself. Have a fabulous weekend. Good night. Real Talk is proudly sponsored by Huawei P20 Pro and MTN. Each week for 10 weeks, we're giving away the latest Huawei.